email address if you want to stay on the mailing list. Uh, the bathrooms are right out here on the left if you need to use those. I also just wanted to make sure that you know that on February 7th, Charles Grayson is going to be talking about the science of music. It's called Science of the Scales. Or what time? The scales are what time? 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, uh, February 6th, did I say 6th? Oh, sorry. 6th, right? 6th, this is 6th, yes. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make sure I was going to be really late. February 6th. Today we're so happy to have uh, Mark Zampanovitz here. He is a, uh, an associate professor at Rowan College, um, Burlington County. And uh, just to give you a little bit of background, Mark got his BS in geology at Bloomsburg University. I won't give years out, so they won't know how we do it. He then got his master's at Old Dominion University, also in geology. He was a staff geologist at Fleur Daniel GTI. I said that right. And today he's going to uh, enlighten us as to why um, geology is important for us and, and how it impacts our everyday life. So thank you very much. I'll turn the floor over. Oh, well, so Mark said he feels comfortable fielding questions throughout the lecture. So if you do have questions, just raise your hand and hopefully you'll see it. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's good to see you all here. Uh, thank you, Laura Ann, for inviting me to uh, come in and speak to uh, this group, and I'm very happy to talk to you about my favorite subject, which of course is geology. Uh, yes, I am an actual geologist, it's as strange as it may seem. Um, and I'm living proof that anybody can learn, actually learn to become a geologist. Um, I didn't really hit my academic stride until, let's say, after high school. Um, in the high school, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I kind of went from here to there, but I really had a very strong budding thing, something that I just couldn't let go, and something that I got into that just, I, I was just crazy about. And that, of course, was... A little louder. I'm sorry. Uh, that, of course, was music. I played music all the time. I was in the band, I was in orchestra, but come graduation, I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe I don't want to blow a horn, blow the horn for the, you know, three plus hours a day for the rest of my life, so maybe I should do something else. And I've always had a interest in astronomy, the weather, archaeology, dinosaurs, and geology just seemed central around all these different things. So I really didn't start getting into geology until actually after high school. But once I got into it, I never looked back. And I've never regretted it a single day of my whole life. So I'm very happy to talk to you about geology. And as Laura said, I'd be happy to answer questions as we go along. So what is geology? Um, I am an instructor at Roman College of Bowling County, so I feel a lot of questions about what people think geology is. And based upon my experience with, experiences with some of my students, it seems that a lot of people get their geologic background primarily from media, uh, TV shows, the occasional documentary, and of course movies, uh, San Andreas, The Core, Volcano, some of the big ones that are out there. Some of these movies are okay, um, some of them are just kind of off base. Uh, but a lot of people don't realize that geology is everywhere, and there's a lot to it, and there's a wondrous world out there right below their very feet. So, a couple of misconceptions about geology. Again, I feel quite a few questions in my classes, and I get some very unusual ideas about what geology actually entails. So, I just wanted to run through some of these, and maybe you've thought about these, or just kind of set the record straight, but these are kind of some of the things that people envision when they think about geology. Uh, number one, earthquakes are rare events. Uh, big earthquakes are rare events. Earthquakes themselves are very common. There are well over one million earthquakes happening every single year. And you can bet that there's probably several earthquakes going on right now somewhere around the globe. Granted, they're relatively small. Uh, they're not like these big earth shakers that crash buildings down, but they are out there. Volcanoes occur only in tropical areas. That's fine. Uh, volcanoes occur everywhere. There are plenty of volcanoes in our polar areas, as well as tropical areas, as well as deserts. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that most of our volcanoes happen beneath the surface of the ocean. Most of our volcanoes happen on the ocean floor. Land-based volcanoes are actually very rare. The Earth is a sphere. Not quite. Uh, it's close to being a sphere, but because of the uh, gravitational pull of the sun, it actually flattens at the poles and kind of elongates at the crater. So technically it's referred to what's called an oblate spheroid. Uh, the Earth is young. 
I guess that depends on your perspective. If you're a cosmologist, yeah, I guess you could say that the Earth is young. But realistically speaking, we know that the Earth is very, very, very old. We'll find out how old it is just a little bit. With minerals, the term massive means the sample is large. Uh, actually, massive means that the sample doesn't have a very clear crystal structure. It's just one irregularly shaped mass. Sea level is constant. We know that's not true. Sea level changes constantly. And over the years, it's changed dramatically. Coastlines on the edges of uh, continents, that's another big one. A lot of people say, well, here I am at the Jersey Shore, I'm standing right where the water meets the land, and I'm looking out over the vast, beautiful Atlantic Ocean, so I've got to be at the edge of the North American continent. That's not really true. The North American continent actually stands about a couple hundred miles out to the Atlantic Ocean. You could actually sail maybe 50 miles off the coast of New Jersey, and you would still technically be over the continent of North America. Uh, it just so happens that this part of the continent is flooded with water. Um, all rivers flow down. That's an interesting one. Uh, this has happened, by the way. Fortunately, it hasn't happened often, but it has happened. Where I'll say, okay, well, all rivers flow from areas of high elevation to low elevation. And people say, okay, well, what about the Nile? And I'll say, well, what about the Nile? And they say, well, the Nile flows from down to up. And I'll say, uh, no, the Nile actually flows from south to north, but it still has to flow from high to low. It happens. Uh, our moon is, is the typical size for all planetary moons. Our moon is actually unusually large compared to other types of moons. Most other planets, their moons are very, very small. So our uh, system of our Earth and our moon actually is very unique in the sense that our moon is actually unusually large for the size of our planet. And Pluto lies at the edge of our solar system. Now you guys probably know about this already. We have found more and more objects beyond the edge of Pluto. So what's the edge of our solar system? We don't really know. Not yet. So. Uh, still trying to figure that out. So, what is geology? Well, first thing that people think of when they think of geology is rocks, which is understandable. I can understand the relationship. But geology is not just about rocks. Geology is everything. I did not necessarily go and study geology because I just wanted to learn about rocks. Not that, that's not necessarily true. I was more interested in all the processes, all the different fascinating dynamic activity, earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, erosion, uh, fossils, all sorts of very dynamic and interesting things. Now, rocks are important in geology, of course they are, because rocks tell the story of geological processes that happen across the planet. But Earth, the, uh, geology itself is actually the study of the Earth. Not just the rocks and the minerals that make up its composition, but everything that is entailed. Rises and falls of sea level, earthquakes, volcanoes, um, ancient life, uh, you name it, all these different facets of the Earth, all of, this in, all of this is encompassed in the field of geology. Now, like I said, rocks are very important in the field of geology because every rock tells a story. I tell my students all the time that there is a written narrative that's out there beneath your very feet. Every pebble is a word. Every rock layer is a sentence. And a geologist knows how to read the clues, read these details within rocks that allow us to understand how the Earth has changed over millions upon millions of years. Now that's a fascinating topic of geology and a very extremely powerful tool that geologists have. We can look at the texture of the rock, we can look at different features within the rock like mud cracks, we can look at fossils within the rock, and we can interpret all these different things to understand the conditions that existed that allowed that rock to form. So it allows us to see very clearly how environments have changed and they have changed dramatically in uh, Earth's lifetime. So as we look at these different rock layers and look at the texture and the fossils and all the different features within these rocks, we can provide a written narrative for how the environment has changed over time. Now the reason why it's important for looking at how the environment has changed over time is it might clue us in into how the environment might possibly change in the future. By reading the clues down within rocks and utilizing various geological principles, Geologists can interpret how the environment has changed over time. So we have a, a series of rock layers that form through the changes in a number of different types of environments. We have a fall tomb that typically forms by, by an earthquake. We have a large granitic intrusion here, which can, can form through uh, various types of volcanic processes. All different things that kind of allow us to take this very dynamic geological situation and look back and retrace the history of this type of uh, situation. Now, just as important in understanding the technical components of geology, the rock layers, how these different rocks form, the texture of the rock, the fossils, 
the feet of global marks and mud cracks and uh, uh, root casts, all these different things. We can kind of look back and see how the environment has changed over time, which is very important. And again, that might close in to see how the environment might change in the future. But one of the reasons why I got into geology is because it also allows us to describe the drastic geological changes that have uh, been at work to give us things like this. That's geology. That's what I like about geology. <coughs> Pretty interesting, if I do say so myself. Or this. Now, for a geologist, that's your laboratory right there. That's your office right there. You have the mountains in the background. You have the alluvial fans right here at the base. You have the alluvium here on the base of the lake. Geologists can look at these different types of environments, look at the rocks, look at the faults, look at the structures, and interpret the geologic history of these areas going back to billions upon millions of years. I like that one myself. Uh, for those of you uh, familiar with Mount Climbing, that's half dome right there in the background. Arch National Park. Coast of Oregon. So there's a lot of geology that's taking place here. A lot of these look like very standard, very set types of environments. You don't see a lot going on, but in fact there actually is. I tell my students, especially in this situation here, beaches are by far the most dynamic environment ever. You have so much geology taking place there. It's all around you. Now, when I go to the beach, I see it. And I feel bad for my wife, God bless her, because I tell her about it all the time, which bores <laughs> her to no end, because she's heard it so many times, but I can't help myself. Uh, but there's geology taking place uh, all over the place. Erosion, erosion here. Uh, this valley here was called by a glacier, uh, glacier actually, a long time ago. Volcanic, uh, volcanic activity here, and of course the work of glaciers, alpine glaciers. So there's geology that's happening all around us, everywhere. And like I said, for geologists, this is your office, this is your field area. This is why it's nice to get into geology. A lot of your other fields, you're in an office, you're in a lab, in an enclosed space, you all just actually get to go outside, which is one of the things that truly you uh, judge. Now, a little bit on the earth itself. A matter of time. Time is a very difficult concept to grasp. And again, I mention this to my students all the time. In my classes, I say well, geology, we talk about rock formation, we talk about mineral uh, crystallization, different types of minerals, different types of rocks, various types of processes, and it can be a little overwhelming when you're first diving into it. But I often say that the most difficult thing to grasp in all of geology is time. That's by far the hardest concept. Because I can tell you that the Earth is very old. We know that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. But can you truly appreciate how old that actually is? It's hard even for me to do it. But think about that, 4.6 billion years old. Or I say, okay, well here's a rock. And the fossils within this rock tells us that this rock formed about 150 million years ago. I say 150 million years? That's crazy, that's an incredibly long time frame. So trying to wrap your head around these vast time spans is an incredible, incredibly challenging aspect of all geology. It really is. But that's the goal of geologists. We have to include these very long, uh, very lengthy time frames. A lot of processes happen over very short time frames. Earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides, these things happen very quickly. But a lot of your geologic processes, processes happen over millions upon millions of years. James Hutton, back in the uh, middle 1700s, known as the father of modern geology. Uh, before Hutton came along, People thought that geology was just that. Volcanoes, earthquakes, landslides, very sudden, very catastrophic event. And there were a group of people known as catastrophists who believed that all geologic processes were very sudden, very dynamic, very life-threatening, and changed the world in very dramatic ways. Hutton came along and realized that, while that is partly true in some cases of geology, a lot of geology happens over very long time frames. So thanks to James Hunt, we now realize that a lot of our geologic processes that take place are not necessarily, not necessarily very sudden and very quick, but some of them happen over very, little, very long time frames. For example, I could take a rock, any type of rock, maybe a sandstone, maybe a pebble in your driveway, leave it outside on the sidewalk. We'll leave it there for maybe five million years. 
Nobody kicks it. Nobody messes around with it. There it is, sitting there five million years. You come back, you get a pile of sediment, a pile of dirt, that's it. But again, think about that. Five million years for that pebble to sit there and get eroded down, get worn down and to get to this pile of sediment. So that's why time is a very, very challenging thing for a lot of people to accept, very difficult to wrap their heads around. Again, even for me as well. The past history of our world must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. One of the famous quotes is the present is key to the past. The present is key to the past. James Hunt said that a lot of the geological processes that we see taking place today have occurred in the past. And again, we know that a lot of our geological processes happen over very long time frames. So if that's true, then we know that the Earth has to have been around for a very long time frame. Again, earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides happen very suddenly, but a lot of other processes happen very, very slowly. Uh, I like this uh, visual. Um, we often look at uh, the time frame of the planet relative to a number of different types of uh, yardsticks. Uh, people often use clocks, people often use uh, uh, the length of your arm, people will use any other type of tool to try to demonstrate how long the Earth has actually been around. In this instance, uh, we're looking at a clock. So, uh, Earth, Earth's crust forms about one second after uh, midnight. That's when the Earth, Earth's crust forms. That's the crust, the, the part of the Earth that we actually walk on. All this rock preserved on the Earth's surface form about 10 minutes and 27 seconds after midnight. Our first bacteria comes around about 70 minutes after midnight. Our first cells with the nucleus don't show up until 40 minutes after midnight. So you see that here for the first half of the Earth, we don't have a lot of information about what's going on. We really don't know a lot about what's going on because a lot of the rocks that are, uh, were formed back then just don't exist today. They've been transformed or modified in one thing or another. Erosion, uh, melting, deformation, what have you. But we see a lot of things happening. As soon as the first cells of the nucleus come on board, all of a sudden things begin to happen. We see our first multicellular life. We see our first jellyfish. Our first fish, about 53 minutes and 25 seconds. Uh, after the hour. First reptiles, about 55 minutes, 42 seconds after the hour. And here, 57 minutes and one second. That's three minutes before midnight, our very first dinosaur. Right? I'm not talking about Triceratops, not Tyrannosaurus rex, those are the big ones, right? The ones that we all know about. But your earliest dinosaurs were much, much smaller, much less spectacular. Our first mammal didn't show up until about 57 minutes and 7 seconds after the hour. And then the Cenozoic era extinctions, that's the uh, asteroid that supposedly came in and destroyed the dinosaurs. I uh, happened about one minute before the hour. And take a look at this, first modern man. One tenth of one second before the end of the hour. So we are on the very edge, the very cusp of all geologic history. Again, 4.6 billion years. And out of that 4.6 billion years, modern men, sorry, modern people, been around, what, maybe 100,000 years? That's it. So there's a huge history here. And it's the job of the geologist to take the rocks, look at the rocks, and decipher what, the, what is involved in that history. And again, one of the big reasons why we do this is because as we look at the past and see what changes have taken place, that might close in to see what changes might take place in the future. Okay. Questions? Uh, I guess about 20 years ago, I was reading the development of light that could be related to materials, earth materials, stardust, whatever. Um, has any progress been made in that area? I, you, you, you pointed out a bacteria, which is life, a life form. Right? Um, but that, I don't know whether anything has to, you know, because you get into the, the religious beliefs and things like that. So. Oh yeah, of course. Well, even scientifically speaking, there's a huge debate as far as when life actually began. To be honest with you, when we look back in time, especially in the geologic time frame, right. there's a pretty good sized margin there because the further back we go, the less evidence we have of what actually the Earth was like in the distant past. Mm -hmm. So we can find out what the Earth was like back, uh, back about 100,000 years ago. We have a lot of evidence that says, okay, we're pretty sure that the environment was like this, we're pretty sure that this existed and right. so on. But as we go back and back further and further in geologic time, the clues just aren't there anymore. Again, they've been worn down, they've been eroded, they've been melted, they've been changed. And thus, the further back we go, the harder it is for us to truly understand what the Earth was like. 
So I know there's a big scientific debate as far as when life actually began, uh, but I haven't heard of any recent progress on that. Yet. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going back 20 years. It, it was the philosopher B. Sharp Band, a Jesuit priest. Yeah. Uh, he predicted when he wrote his books that we would discover life. And, and they did. I think recently, you know, bacteria. Mm -hmm. They they created a bacteria, which is a life form. Right. But that's as that's as far as I know what it, what's going on. In other words, nothing's happened since. Right. Well, there's been a lot that taking place, but again, it's all been a matter of data. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if anybody here. This week on there's a PBS program, no, but they had a program that life's rocky started, and it really put all this stuff together about. Well, minerals and life were connected. Right. And they had a lot of information in there. I, I recommend it to oh. be interested in that. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. As a matter of fact, one of the things I'm going to touch on a little bit later on is how geology and oceanography and meteorology have often, often been looked at as individual sciences. They've all been looked at as separate from each other. We now know that there's a very close relationship, a very intimate relationship between each one of these sciences. And that's something that knew, uh, knew that the earth sciences actually geared towards the interplay between geology, meteorology, and oceanography, and even biology. Uh, all these things work together to give us the other that we see today. Very good, thank you. Uh, so, very, very quick. Just want to give you a quick introduction to your Earth. Uh, not a lot of detail here, I apologize, but I uh, want to make sure that we uh, kind of move things along. Uh, but this is what we know about the Earth right now. The Earth is composed of four primary layers. The first one is the crust. Like I said before, the crust is that which you walk on every single day. It is the outermost layer, it is by far the thinnest layer, composed of two different types of rock. We have continental rock and oceanic rock. Continental makes up the continents, ocean makes up the oceans. So you guys know that. I explain that to my students, I'm like, you guys know that, right? But just to be on the safe side. It's all rock, very hard, rigid, uh, inflexible. Different type of rock, but solid. Uh, very, very thin. At its thickest point, which is the Himalayan Mounts, uh, reaches up to about 70 kilometers uh, around uh, 40 miles, give or take. 40 miles away. Below that, we have the Mandarin, which is by far the thickest part of the Earth. About 2,900 kilometers thick, about 1,800 miles, and composed of iron rich rock. Beneath the Mandarin, we have the outer core. Now, the outer core is mostly made of iron, or so we think. And, oddly enough, believed 